I am Milani Kai, Gracie Award-winning talk show host and the number one news talk radio station in all of America, right here in Atlanta, 95.5 WSB. It is an honor to have on my next guest for a couple of reasons. It's Women's History Month, but more so than that, since 1881, there have only been 11 presidents of historic Spelman College. My guest happens to be the 11th. Not only that, she sits on, I could go on and on, she sits on so many boards that I'm fascinated by. For instance, the Rockefeller Foundation, and she's memberships with the Council on Foreign Relations, Coca-Cola and on, but she's also what I consider a scientist, a doctor, and we're gonna find out how she ended up here in Atlanta, Georgia at this historic college. So get into it, Dr. Helene, Gail, thank you so very much for being here with us. Oh, my pleasure, my honor. So I wanna go back to Buffalo, New York, because oftentimes when we hear about New York, people from New York, everybody thinks New York City. But I wanna travel 300 miles to my, from my hometown, which is Troy, New York, to a place called Buffalo, New York. And I wanna talk about Dr. Gail as a child. So your father was a small business owner, your mom's into social work. Bring me back to maybe when you're about 14 years old, 13 years old, somewhere around there. What's happening in your world? So when I was 13, 14 years old, um, you know, I was kind of coming of age in, in Buffalo, New York, and, you know, was very influenced by the movements of our day. Um, you know, I was coming up at the time the civil rights movement was at its height when movements for liberation of colonialized countries in Africa, uh, the women's movements, all of those things were really uh, played very much into my childhood, my growing up and the way I viewed the world. And it was part of what gave me kind of the social change bug, if you will, as I saw so many movements um, happening around and seeing great change happening, not only in the United States, uh, but also the world. And, you know, as you mentioned, my parents, you know, I grew up in a family where education was a really important part of what uh, our parents wanted uh, and expected from us, but they also wanted to make sure that we used our education in a way that um, gave back and made a contribution to the world. So I think those two influences in my life, my, my parents who were great role models of giving back to the community, as well as being part of a period in history of great social change and important social movements, you know, really impacted my desire to use my my life in a way that um, you know thought about something bigger than just myself. You go from Buffalo, you get your undergrad undergrad degree in psychology. At what point between either that childhood or that undergrad degree, what point do you say, hey? I want to go and study medicine. How does how does that happen? Are there were there physicians in your family? What was the influence behind that? Well, you know, I I as I said, you know, really wanted to be able to use my education the way that gave back. Um, I was lucky to go to Barnard College where there was a big pre med focus and a lot of women going into the medical field, and so. You know, I got influenced very early by Barnard College and Columbia University and the, and so many students who were pre-med. And I just thought that, um, you know, the ability to have that very concrete tool of helping to improve health, which is so central to so many other things in our lives. If you don't have good health, it's hard to have a good income. Uh, it's hard to have the kind of opportunities that make uh, for uh, a more fulfilling life. So I, I saw medicine as a very practical way in which I could make a contribution to society. We're talking to Dr. Gail. She's the 11th president of Spelman College. Speaking of that, I, I told you I'm from Troy, New York. That's my native. And growing up, 
which is another reason why your story fascinates me. Growing up, all of our doctors in this part of upstate New York were Indian or white. I did not see a black physician until I moved to Atlanta. So I wonder how it was in Buffalo when you were growing up. Was it a little different than Troy, New York? Did you see women of color uh, as physicians there? Yeah, for sure. You know, Buffalo, um, and I will. I always have to tell people, you know, Buffalo is more like growing up in the Midwest than it is growing up, um, uh, you know, in in New York City and such. And so, you know, it had that real kind of Midwest feel, very close knit community. The black community was very close knit, but it was also at a time when, and I didn't know at the time, we were essentially redlined. So. You know, our black community had doctors and lawyers and judges, um, electricians, plumbers, school teachers. So, so we saw the whole gamut. Uh, my pediatrician was a black woman. Wow. Uh, you know, our family physician was a, was a black man, and so we were able to see images of people in medicine and other high level professional fields. And always had the sense that you know we had the ability, and our our tribe, our family, our community expected that we would um, you know reach our highest potential. Well, just about four hours from Troy, from where I'm from, I didn't know all that was going on down there. Uh, so we're talking to Dr. Yell on during Women's History Month. Now, you, you get through a very impressive school, the University of Penn for medicine. Did you know exactly? where you were heading with medicine? Was it general at that point? Or did you have a clear understanding, a clear vision of where you wanted to be in medicine? Well, my first thought, because I was a psychology major, was that I was going to go into psychiatry. Um, but as I took rotations and, you know, in medical school, you had the opportunity to basically sample all the different uh, medical specialties. I was really drawn to pediatrics, and you know, I, I um, you know believe that how we treat our children and the health um, journey that you start as a child is so important to how your health continues throughout life. So I really got drawn into uh, pediatrics, but I also um, started appreciating public health. Uh, through different courses and through different exposures that I had. Um, and so started thinking also about how I might combine my career in pediatrics with a focus on public health. You know, when you're a individual clinician, you help individuals one by one, and that's wonderful. And we need great physicians to make sure that each of us have the kind of care that we need. But I also was always interested, and again, it goes back to you know some of my roots of being very interested in broad movements and social change. And so I got interested in public health because as, as opposed to your patient being an individual, when you're practicing public health, your patient is a community, um, sometimes a nation and even the world. And, and so you know, I thought of public health as a way that I could use the tools of medicine, but in a way that could produce bigger and broader changes within populations. You're listening to Milani Kai on 95.5 WSB, Atlanta's News and Talk. As you're doing this, as you're focused on your career, what are some of your extracurricular activities that you're doing? Or were, were you one of those people who were just career focused in your books and you're not doing anything else but study, 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 study? No, you know, I've always been incredibly curious and uh, always feel like I learn by doing. Um, and so, you know, I have always had a lot of extracurricular activities, whether in school being student class president or when I was in college helping with health fairs in communities of um, you know, medical need. Um, and now, as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, I serve on several boards that give me an opportunity to see the world in a more broad and holistic sense and to be able to connect the dots, if you will, between the things that have big influence on our lives. 
Dr. Helene Gill. She is the 11th president of Spelman College. She's joining us right now. One of the things that intrigues me about your story is a how you're the president. Of course, that's very intriguing, but also your concern for those who are what we say misrepresented, underprivileged for for poor communities. It's an activism, not just in America, but you deal with it from around the world, working with an organization called, ironically, CARE. What was your pat? Why are you so passionate about those who are less privileged than many of us? Well, you know, for me, um, my career, I hope that it, it uh, is reflected in the choices that I've made about work and career. You know, it's always been about how do we um, do the most for those who have the least? How can we really fight for equity and social justice? You know, with, with the strong belief that all of us have uh, equal potential, but not equal opportunity. And how can we make sure that everyone has the ability to reach their full potential and that we give them what they need to be able to do that? And so whether it's through my work at the Centers for Disease Control, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or CARE, or the Chicago Community Trust, and now at Spelman, where I think we're giving young, bright, African-American women the opportunity to get the kind of education that will allow them to go out and be change makers. So for me, it's always been about equity and social justice and making sure that we all have the opportunity to realize our full potential. How important is Spelman to not just the Atlanta community or the Georgia community, but how important is the college that you now sit as 11th president of that's amazing since 1881, 11th president, how important is Spelman to the entire world? Well, you know, Spelman is not only a national treasure, but it's a global treasure. You know, we have students who come from uh, over 40 states in, in the nation, although we're situated here in, in Atlanta and in Georgia, you know, we are definitely serve a national uh, student body. We also have uh, always students who come from around the world uh, of multiple nationalities, in particular people who come from Africa and the diaspora. So, you know, we see ourselves as being a global institution and one where we both, you know, hopefully bring Spelman to the world and the world to Spelman. And in this day and age, as all of us need to think of ourselves, not only as citizens of the United States, but as global citizens, we feel that it's incredibly important that our students get that sense of uh, a global education and appreciate what's going on in the rest of the world. And, you know, we've had several of our alums go on to be ambassadors, work for the State Department, do other uh, global careers. So we think it's incredibly important that, that we not only be a national resource, but a global resource. If you could travel back in time, way back in time, to someone who is no longer with us, who has transitioned, who is one person, maybe there are many, but give me one person who you would like to meet that you've not met, who is no longer with us. Oh, well, I was going to say Nelson Mandela, but I've met him. Um, Harriet Tubman, you know, the courage that she had the foresight, the unwavering commitment that she had. You know, I would love to sit down one day and just talk about what did that mean for her to be so determined in what she did, put her life at risk, knowing that what she was doing was going to um, change the trajectory for enslaved Africans um, for generations and decades to come. Dr. Gell, I watched your inauguration and my father always taught me that your reputation is not what you think of yourself, but what others think about you. And the constant continuous word that kept coming up in regards to you is 
transformational leader, 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 said all of your colleagues, said everybody who ever worked for you. Did you see yourself as you're going throughout your career? Is that in the back of your head? I want to be a leader. I want to be a leader. Or it just happened like that. Definitely was not in the back of my head. Definitely not something I go around calling myself. Um, I just want to get stuff done. And, you know, being to, to do that means you need to be a leader, if you will, figure out how to chart a course, how to make sure that you have a team that is aligned with where you're going, work with that team to develop a blueprint for where you're going and, you know, be able to bring out the best in people, um, you know, and so if that's what a leader is, then I'm proud to be a leader, but more than anything, I just want to get stuff done. And that's another thing everybody said. I heard one, I recall, I can't recall his name, but it was one of your colleagues uh, when you were during the inauguration. He said that uh, I get stuff done fast. He said, but Dr. Gail, she gets stuff done way faster. So that's part of your reputation as well. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I know we got to go up with a few more questions for you. We're talking to Dr. Gail. She is the 11th president of Historic Spelman College. The college has been around since 1881, only 11 presidents. It's our honor to have you here. What do you want your legacy to be? People are already talking, as we said, call you a leader, transformational leader. You're a pioneer. Uh, I didn't even go through half of your credentials and accolades. They're all there because I wanted to get to know you as a person. But when, when you look back on your life, what is it that you want the generations after us to take from your work? Well, mostly, you know, what I hope that I have been able to do is to take organizations and leave them in a better place than they were before I came, to work with organizations whose missions are aligned with the things that, that I want to accomplish in terms of greater equity, greater social justice, um, and hopefully to also be able to train and leave in place a group of people who follow behind me who continue that work. And so, you know, it's why I'm so uh, honored and, and thrilled to be here at Spelman because I feel like this is a chance to help to shape the next generation of African American women who will be change leaders. And so if I can continue to do my part, but make sure that I'm reaching back to bring others with me, you know, then I think I will have accomplished something. Well, I've got to thank you. And like I said at the top of this, always when I when I see someone who's from upstate New York, like myself, and not New York City, uh, it is just an honor to know that good things do come out of upstate New York. And I just want you to speak in, it's Women's History Month, and we are going through some challenging times, as you know, everybody, not just women. It's a challenging time in 2024. Uh, people are concerned, the economy, you know, they're concerned about their money, their life, their health, their wealth. How can you encourage people, as we're here in March of 2024, to, to keep pressing on, to keep going after their goals and dreams, to, to, to not give up on life? What's a word that you can say to them? I guess I would say take the long view. Um, it's easy when we're living through tough times to think that we've never been here before, um, that the only way is uh, down, not up. But I think if we look at history and if we look at the ups and downs of some of the things that um, you know we have fought for. There have been um, downturns and moments that have been very discouraging, but I think it's up to us to continue to rally, to continue to pull together, and understand that you know we're in this fight for the long haul. And, you know, I think it's always important to keep in mind that, you know, we've got to be in this for the long haul. We've got to take the long view. Um, countries, societies that have taken the long view ultimately are uh, victorious. But I think that's the kind of thinking that we need to have. 
Well, Forbes named her one of the 100 most powerful women, and she decided to join us on 95.5 WSB Radio. I cannot be more elated. Thank you for all that you do, not just for Spellman, the community. Of course, you said you worked for the, uh, you, did, you did a lot of work for the CDC and around the world. I could not get into all of it, but the fact that you took time out of your schedule to join me just makes me, I'm, I'm, done, I'm done working for the day, okay? I'm, I'm taking I'm taking off the rest of the month. But Dr. Gell, thank you so much. And I really look forward to meeting you in person and, and continuing to cover all that you're doing at Spelman. Thank you for who you are and for being a representative of not just black excellence, of not just women's excellence, but regardless of gender or race, just excellence overall. We appreciate you. Thank you, my, my honor and my pleasure.